Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. I love how whenever we uh, hint at a guest on the show, everyone instantly defaults to Steve Eisenman. And like, look, we would love to chat with Steve Eisenman. Like long term, we want our press credentials. We want to be talking to Steve Eisenman in an official capacity like that. Of course, that's the goal. But let's make this clear. Steve Eisenman would be a terrible podcast interview. (laughs) It's actually Gary Bettman this week. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's Gary Bettman. (laughs) Very candid. We just skipped Steve Eisenman altogether and just went right to the top. We uh, actually finished negotiating the CBA. You're welcome, players and fans. Uh, we uh, we worked in three compliance buyouts for all teams uh, based in Michigan. <laughs> That's the best I could come up with. <laughs> no, uh, it's not Steve Eisenman, and it's not Gary Bettman. Um, it, it's not Steve Eisenman for uh, the reason our, our actual interview uh, uh, guest star today tells us about he plays things very close to the chest and doesn't exactly say much when he's going about his business and that's what steve eisman is doing maybe when he retires he'll be more of a an electric uh uh, podcast guest but for now uh we're gonna stick to trying to uh get those press credentials but in the meantime we do have a fun interview for you guys today but before we get to that we have some things to talk about welcome to the winged wheel podcast i'm ryan Hanna. i'm brad crisco and i'm yeezy for preezy (laughs) I, I forgot to look at you. <laughs> I'm really playing with fire. Uh, none of us three are running for um, president, prime minister, supreme leader of anything. You don't speak Not for me yet. None of us three are running for president. <laughs> Uh, this episode of the podcast, we are going to be chatting a little bit about the inner workings of the NHL and, and things that are projecting for the future. Everything from return to play to CBA discussions to the salary cap, um, et cetera, et cetera. We are going to be getting into our uh, interview with none other than former NHL GM, president and head coach Doug McLean. Uh, he's gonna, he, he gave us an excellent, excellent interview. I think you guys are gonna really enjoy it. Um, and then we are gonna talk about some Red Wings relevant stuff before heading into overtime. So, um, if anybody we, thinks that people who work in hockey management don't get as a, uh, don't get irrationally angry about the draft lottery like we do, <laughs> listen to this interview. <laughs> We'll wait. I'm going to wait till we come back from the interview for me to talk about some of my favorite points about it because I don't want to spoil it. But it, there was just so much validation in there. Um, but before that, uh, everything that's been happening with return to play and, and the CBA and stuff. Is it just me or do all of Bob McKenzie's tweets just like like visually look the exact same to you? Like the exact same as each other at this point? Yes. I think I th- it's just scheduled tweets, honestly. And then uh, our brains interpret the pattern. Yeah, it's just like a random amalgamation of the words phase, CBA, discussion, three, four, COVID, you know, not guaranteed, subject to change. And it's just like, bam, 280 characters, tweet. It's not that he's not tweeting out stuff that's valuable. Like, it's all there. It's just like such a a huge overload of news that it all just we've become desensitized to it. And especially as Red Wings fans, like we had such god awful news that we've tuned out to everything else. We don't want to listen no matter how important it is. But But this one sounds like there's hockey at the end of the tunnel. So that's. A positive, not Red Wings hockey, which, well, could be a positive depending on how you view it. But, yeah, there's hockey at the end of this tunnel if the Blues don't ruin it for us. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. I can't even believe that one. You can't Just, believe I, I mean, I can't. I can't. Yeah, no, I know. I I uh, There's already a video. Who was it? Jake Vertanning throwing up in a club. The, the fact that four Blues went to a bar and contracted Corona is honestly the least surprising thing that's been reported this week. Yeah. Um, so with the whole return to play discussion, obviously phases three and four, I think that's where we're at right now. We're trying to get into are being negotiated and that's all standard, but a silver lining to all of this, depending on who you ask, is that they're working in a CBA extension at the same time. 
and all it took was the end of the world for this to happen without a lockout. Um, nothing solidified, of course, and we're going to hold off on going too in depth on it. Um, but there are some general talking points that have been released, such as the Olympics are a part of it, which is fantastic news. Amazing. We get, we finally get to watch, uh, NHL players back at the Olympics again, and it will have been eight years since the last time that happened. Um, and then they're talking about the salary cap and escrow. And those are things that are most important to the owners and, and the players, uh, for obviously opposite sides of the coin. Uh, players want to keep escrow as low as possible and owners want to keep the salary cap lower. So their expenditure is lower. Um, the salary cap stuff inspired some dis- discussion that was directly relevant to the Red Wings. And this is where you probably, if you were in the room of Steve Eisenman at the time of this being announced, he was the one, like that was the most excited you've, you've seen him at any point, including the draft lottery. The draft lottery is out of his hands. What can he do? You know, great. You're picking, I'm, I'm picking fourth. I'll pick this guy because I think he's the best. That's it. Like I had almost no say in this, but with the salary cap, a lowered salary cap for multiple years, especially when teams were planning on it increasing, and they were planning on it increasing for good reason because hockey revenue was going up. There's going to be a new TV deal, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, teams are in a bind, and they will continue to be in a bind. And what happens when they're in a bind and they don't get compliance buyouts, which doesn't look to be a part of the CBA? They need help, and they will give you things in exchange for helping them. Steve Eisman's best asset on this roster right now is a uh, is the salary cap that the Detroit Red Wings have. So this is potentially really great news for Steve Eisman. There are several teams who um, I think, if the math works out, could give league minimum contracts to the amount of players that their roster is short going into, ne- into next year and would go over the salary cap. So they will have to shed players. So it's not like, oh, it would be nice if we had some more salary cap space so we could sign player X. No, these are teams that have to shed salary or they cannot get be compliant by the beginning of next season. And given the relatively short offseason we're going to have, depending how deep some of these teams go, they're not going to get a lot of time to uh, try and find creative outlets to get out of it. So it might just be, um, Stevie's old buddy up in Tampa Bay. Hey, we could really stand to get Alex Kalorn's five million off the books. How does our first and or second round pick look to you? And Stevie could go, yes, please. And then Vancouver could call up. Hey, we're screwed. Looks like you need a goalie. Let's unload a call. Let's unload Louis Erickson and somehow get you Thatcher Demko. Cause also this is the one thing that I haven't heard that is relevant for this because this could be a, Double-edged sword for Detroit, but both edges are good things because a team like Vancouver, like hear me out. And I, and I use Vancouver specifically because they are the most obvious. Obviously they want to resign Jakob Markstrom in the off season for this hypothetical. Let's just say they do. Not only are they going to be hard up against the cap, even more so with Markstrom on the books for five, six, seven million. That means next summer presents a problem because they have to leave one of Markstrom or Demko exposed to Seattle. Yeah, so, the Seattle expansion draft is a huge factor. So teams that are at this limit of, hey, we have these two goalies we don't want to lose for nothing or these eight forwards that we can't stand to lose. Steve Eisenman could come shuttling in on his white horse and be like, hey. I'm here to save you guys. So let me make this clear for everybody listening, uh, because this question will be asked in every overtime we do between now and the start of next <laughs> season. The Detroit Red Wings should sign exactly zero free agents. They need every single penny of cap space they can get because in a perfect world they're taking on multiple bad contracts. They're taking on Louis Erickson, they're taking on Alex Kalor and this guy, that guy, so on and so forth. They are just getting contracts as many as they can to accumulate as many first and second round picks as they can and or prospects. They are in a very advantageous situation right now and don't think Steve Eisenman doesn't know that. He's not going to take on any three, four-year contracts, but he will take on every bad one- or two-year contract you can throw at him right now. So obviously we know Mantha Bertuzzi's contracts are up, and that's going to be very relevant to the amount of cap space the Red Wings have. 
But beyond those two and Fabry and the, obviously the RFAs, nothing. That is the goal for Stevie. Nothing. If you want, and here's the thing too, because people will say, well, shouldn't they bring in like a player like Michael Granlund to help the team or player Y to help the team? Again, in this hypothetical, do you know who makes the Red Wings better just by being there? Alex Kalorn. Louis Erickson, these objectively bad players on other teams are upgrades over at least six forwards or defensemen on this team. It's a win-win. Yeah, when you said uh, they should sign exactly no one, I had a moment of protest where I was going to say, well, I mean, if they do have a chance to make like a minor upgrade that center, if like Gagne walks or, you know, whoever, Gagne wasn't going to play center, I guess, but you know what I mean. And then I thought about that same thing. I was like, no, like Louis Erickson is a an impediment to the Vancouver Canucks right now, but he's actually not God awful, especially relevant to the the current Red Wings. Like the Red Wings shouldn't be signing anyone except to fill out the bare minimum threshold of roster needs. And you can hit two birds with one stone by, by taking that on through trades like Brad mentioned. Um, as to actual specific targets, that will be a topic of conversation for weeks to come. So um, you can continue to throw those questions our way, but uh, trust that we will uh, be highlighting those as well. But yeah, it's going to be the biggest opportunity for the Red Wings um, to make a difference. Like Going down the path of drafting and developing prospects is the most like speed limit way of conducting a rebuild. And you're subject to go slower if you miss on those picks, or you're subject to go faster if you draft like a Quinn Hughes seven, seventh overall. That's that's how it goes. The real difference, this is how you get on the Autobahn, is by making a ludicrous deal for a prospect or a pick by taking on a bad contract that turns out to be like a grand slam. And all of a sudden you have this guy that you had no business even having in your organization because you were creative with your roster construction and your cap space and bam, you have another massive piece that your your team and your fan base never thought would come your way. And all of a sudden you're competitive a year before you thought you would be. And like, just sorry, one more thing here, Brad, the usual like hate watchers <laughs> that we have and people who really like really resent us for one of many reasons, honestly. Um, uh, the chorus has been lately, um, Eisenman said he wasn't going to be active in free agency, so I don't know why you think this is a big deal. Eisenman's not going to be active in free agency as in he's not going to go bid $8 million on Michael Granlund, and he's not going to go and uh, try to pick up Taylor Hall um, at a price point that doesn't make sense for this team right now, especially because he won't be playing for a good team for four or five more years and then he's out of his prime. But he will be active in making trades to get teams under the cap. That's a different, it's a whole different realm. So uh, if you think to when Eisenman had his, you know, protest about an early draft, his only point of contention was that an early draft meant he had less time to make trades before the draft because he knows teams are going to need help to get under the cap. Especially in a shortened off season. So yeah. if you're sitting there and go, well, how much could the Red Wings really get for taking on a bad contract? May I remind you, that the Carolina Hur Hurricanes will have a first round pick in the mid teens in all likelihood this year because they acquired Patrick Marlowe from the Leafs last offseason, who only had one year left on his contract. They got a first round pick to take on one year of a bad contract. Now, Obviously, the Leafs last summer were in a worse cap position than most. So they're probably going to, they were probably at that point a little more desperate than I would imagine any team will be this offseason. But nevertheless, it shows the type of premium cap space carries for these good teams who don't have cap space. And again, we keep talking about Tampa, Toronto, Vancouver, because those are the ones that come immediately to the top of mind for me. Those are far from the only teams that are in there. I'm sure if you went to cap friendly and ran down the list, there's probably two, three more teams that are just, Oh God, there are not enough teams to eat these dead contracts. Uh, Counting all the counting the final balance of cat versus LTIR use. And it's different because we're, you know, close to the end of the season right now in air quotations because who knows where we actually are. Um, but the cap hits at the time of stoppage, more than half of the league had less than a million dollars to work with. That's not good <laughs> for everybody. Well, for, I mean, that's, that's how teams good for us. Yeah. 
that's how teams operate, right? And granted, like that's not counting how many teams are getting like for the Red Wings, for example, have like a hundred million dollars coming off the books. Like a lot of these teams aren't going to be in that position, but there is no shortage of teams who a are already in a tight spot. And they were in a tight spot, assuming an eighty-five million dollar cap hit. And then you you think that it's going to freeze at eighty one and a half or stay around there? I thought those numbers were reported. It's a flat cap for two more seasons, and then the the it only goes up by like a million per year the next two years. So oh great, these teams get to add an extra fourth liner. It's it's bleak for cap strap teams for the next three to four years at least. And again, you think about the Red Wings position here, and they've got Larkin Lark up relatively long term uh ideally mantha and bertuzzi and maybe even fabry will be locked up long term going into next year so who are the big contracts coming up after this year that the red wings really have to worry about uh it is honestly zadina heronic and whoever the hell we draft in october there is not a lot for the red wings to worry about they are going to be cap advantaged they're going to have a lot of cap leverage as soon as they're able to start wheeling and dealing with that again. And not only that, consider that uh, after next season, Darren Helms nearly $4 million comes off the books. Valtteri Filippula's $3 million comes off the books. And Luke Glendening's uh, $1.8 comes off the books. Patrick Nemeth, he might be brought back. Um, that's even more money for them to work with. And like Brad mentioned, this isn't just for a year or two. This is for... The next while, after the current CBA, like it, it's not this. Is, like this is going to be an advantageous situation for teams for possibly the next three to five years, and then after those contracts run out, the year after we're looking at Franz Nielsen with over five million coming off, and Justin Ablocator with over uh, four million coming off the year after that. Like the Red Wings have through a lot of pain, mind you. Like the, <laughs> there's been a death by a thousand cuts before you get to this. But then each one of those cuts is now slowly healing and it's created this stepwise solution where the Red Wings can continue to build their team, leverage their cap space, and have that added little bonus or perk year after year after year as they gain more cap space with a bad contract falling off. So not saying it's going to work perfectly, not saying every RFA contract is going to be signed beautifully. Like by no means is that going to be like the absolute optimal case. No. And, you know, maybe there aren't any takers or all the good deals get taken up by other teams and, and people are scared of the wizardry that Steve Eisman has done in trades in the past. That's, <laughs> I would be if I was a GM. But there is a lot of opportunity and not just for the summer, for years to come. Yeah, it's it's not unreasonable thing for the next three summers. The Red Wings will be actively looking to take on other teams' dead contracts, which as much as a global pandemic sucks, that flat cap for the next few years is music to steve eisenman's ears because again if if the red wings were in a position where larkin bertuzzi mantha zadina heronic were all due up for contracts next summer yeah you probably want to save that cap space but honestly their their biggest hurdle contract wise coming up in the next few years is probably when larkins expires like there's that much grace period so yeah uh, and that's again assuming the red wings don't dive heavy into free agency in the next couple summers which i don't see them doing anyway um would they maybe take a run like a six seven million dollar swing at like a ryan nugent hopkins next summer yeah eventually you got to start filling out the roster yeah but they will again have more than enough space to do that yeah so there will be plenty to, of discussion on that to come um still some more concerted discussion because as brad mentioned you know we have the mantha the pertuzzi the fabry rfa deals to to talk about um don't worry that will be coming all summer uh but for now let's uh, get talking about uh doug mcclain um former uh nhl executive at every level um from head coach all the way up to uh president um, for those who don't know, he was uh, in the Red Wings organization from 1990 to 1994. Um, and so that was just as the Red Wings were coming out of the Dead Wings era and uh, entering into the um, vastly successful dynasty that that we know and love. Um, new and love, I guess, sadly. Um, full of stories, amazing, amazing anecdotes, tidbits. Uh, <laughs> just it, like it, it was just a fun interview. And, and I remember what we said like afterwards was just like we knew he was going to be good but like man those are some great uh some great pieces we he offered up time, so no problem <laughs> oh honestly i just felt bad because you no know, guy has a life to live um 
So without further ado, our interview with uh, former head coach, GM, NHL president, and as you'll see, he has one other title in there, Doug McLean. Enjoy. Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. First ever interview uh, with a former general manager, uh, former NHL president and head coach, and current new PEI real estate developer, Doug McLean. Doug, thank you so much for joining us today. You're stumbling through that. You're nervous with the call me, eh? Well, I know that. <laughs> retired. I know. I had to scratch unemployed out of my list when he said real estate developer. You threw us for a loop. You know, when I was up using the bathroom at 4 o'clock this morning, I was thinking about all the mornings. I used to get up at 4 o'clock and head to the airport so I could be in Toronto, whether I was leaving Florida at 4 in the morning or PEI at 4 in the morning to, go, to get to Toronto to do that show. And I was thinking this morning, I don't really miss it that much. So you you prefer <laughs> so summer life in PEI then? You know what? We're we're actually we're seven or eight months in Florida and and four to four and a half months in PEI. So it's really uh, and I was traveling back and forth from both Florida and PEI. I had to go to Toronto there every week, so it was fine. I had a great time with Kipper and Millard and the boys. It was a it was a it was a great gig, and I had a lot of fun. So yeah, I miss it a little bit, but you know uh, we'll see. Well, to jump back in time and actually speaking of the sports net boys um i i reached out to a mutual friend of ours at Sportsnet when i found out you were going to be on the podcast and i asked him what would be a good question or story to start with doug about to kick off the interview on a light note and i was instructed to ask you about what steve eiserman said to you about coaches <laughs> <laughs> Well, I hate to tell the story because I actually I'm writing a book and I it, it the story's in the book and I was sort of chuckling about it the other day. Actually, there's quite a few Red Wing stories. I'm I'm doing a book that's going to come out next October, a year a year uh, from this October, and it's called Draft Day, and it's all about uh, you know all the, all my experiences and stories in there. But anyway, the Steve Eisen story was Stevie was a when I was in Detroit, he was a young, young captain. And uh, I suppose when I met him, he was shaving and I was shaving in the, in the Red Wings dressing room after practice. And he looked at me and he said, uh, Doug, he said, so I've had Brad Park. I've had Danny Belisle. I've had Nick Polano. I've had Jacques Demers. I've had Brian Murray and you. Imagine how good I could have been if I just had one good coach. <laughs> he said, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty good player. He said, I'm a pretty good player. I said, yeah, Steve, you're, that's how we actually started out. He said, Doug, I'm a pretty good player. And I said, yeah, you're a really good player. So like, he was scoring 50 goals. And then he went on to tell this story. And he said, imagine how good I could have been if I would have had just one good coach in my career. So it basically he was giving us a pretty good shot, you know, but he was an interesting guy in those days to coach because he was, he was a young captain and he, he had a ton of pressure on, put a ton of pressure on himself sort of to, to be the guy. And he, he really was amazing on the ice. And you remember his, you know, early when he's in his twenties, how good he was. I mean, he was captain of the Red Wings when he was 23, if I'm not mistaken. And we were there, he was probably 27 or 28. And, uh, he was, he was struggling because he put the weight of the team on his shoulders and we weren't quite good enough. You know, we lost out to Toronto. We had a two nothing series lead there one year and we lost to San Jose when Scotty came in When Scotty was coaching his first year. We lost to San Jose and he, Stevie put a ton of pressure, but you know, he, in those days, was he a great captain? Well, he was a young captain, but when he got good support, you know, support came in from, the likes of Constantine, not Constantine, but Constantine up emerging and Larry Onoff and that whole group. Uh, he really took it to a whole nother level and became one of the greatest captains in the history of the game. So uh, he, he really, uh, you know, he, he needed support and, and uh, they got him support after Brian and I left. Uh, we brought in Brad McCrimmon to be with him and Rick Green as guys, and it didn't really work. It didn't go over well, to be quite honest. And we brought those guys in with him and, uh, so once these other group came and the team was ready to win, it really made it a lot better for him, you know, but he, he was, you know, Scotty Bowman gets a ton of credit for 
for being the guy. And he was a, one of the greatest coaches in the history of hockey. But Stevie and Larry Onoff were the guys that controlled that dressing room big time. They controlled it. So the one thing that was kind of relevant to that era, your era with the Red Wings and a few of the things you're just touching on, obviously the Red Wings currently are, are terrible, but eventually the hope is they'll be good. You got there right when the Red Wings were kind of transitioning out of the dead wings into the perennial contender that we came to new. What was it that was so important to change in that organization that finally over those four years, got them to be a consistently good team? Well, you know, when, when we came in, Brian Murray and I, Jock Demers had had pretty good success. Jock sort of got them over that hump where they were bad and, uh, and got them to be a better team. But they were a really veteran team when we sort of went in there. And, and the transition started when we were there, and it was, and it was mostly – because of the draft before we went there. I mean, Neil Smith and Jimmy Devolano and, and Kenny Holland did a masterful job of that 89 draft. And it's well documented. You know, when you get, uh, you know, what was it? Sillinger was the first round pick. I think Bobby Bugner might have been the second round pick. And then it goes Lidstrom is the third round pick and Fedorov is a fourth round pick and Konstantinov is 11th round pick. And Dallas Drake was a sixth or seventh round pick in that draft. So that draft is unbelievable. But I remember, I'll never forget the first day I flew into Windsor, my first day on the job, Brian Murray picked me up at the Windsor airport and we're driving across the bridge. He said, Oh, something big happened to the Red Wings today. And he said, it's not you coming in as associate coach. It's Fedorov defected last night. And Fedorov was in Seattle and he defected. The night before I came to Detroit for my first day on the job was Sergei Fedorov's first day. So Sergei steps on the ice for his first training camp. I mean, he, I remember Brian Murray and I sitting in Flint watching this kid who was probably 19 at the time, just turned 20. And I'm looking at Brian looks at me and says, Oh my God, how good is this guy? And then the rest is history. I mean, Sergei went on to have play for 20 plus years in the NHL and, um, yeah, Lidstrom came and Lidstrom, I remember uh, I, funny story. Uh, I was sitting at home one night, one o'clock in the morning, I get a call from Brian and he's in Sweden. And he said, I just watched one of our prospects play and Doug, you're not going to believe it. He is going to be better than Al McGinnis. And I said, Brian, go have another beer and phone me tomorrow. Al McGinnis at the time was a superstar. He had just watched Nick Lidstrom play the year after the Red Wings had drafted him. And I guess Brian wasn't drinking. He was really right. So, I mean, Nick come on the ice a year later, stepped on the ice, his first practice. And I was on the ice with him. And I thought, Oh my God, this guy is special. This guy never had a bad practice, never had a bad game and became one of the greatest defensemen of all time. So, you know, we were lucky. We got we drafted Lapointe, we drafted McCarty, which were were good guys. We picked up Draper, we picked up Timmy Taylor. I mean, there was some. You know, it was a it was a it was a good time. Shevel Day was pretty good in goal. You know, he looked like he was going to be a real good goalie, but didn't get over the hump a little bit. Maybe the team wasn't quite good enough, but yeah, it was it was fun times those four years in Detroit. Really great times. So I, I want to circle back to. Um when you talk there about Sergei defecting, because obviously nowadays it's, it's not really a question of if Russians are going to come over anymore. It's just how long till they come over. And obviously with the iron curtain just falling. One thing I've always been curious, because I was only three, four years old at the time is what was the energy from the fan base and, and hockey media like when they would find out any Russian would defect, but specifically Sergei Fedorov defected and is coming to Detroit. Well, you know, when he was drafted, it was sort of, okay, McGillney's drafted, he's drafted, Burray's drafted. They were sort of the big three on the, on the Russian world junior team. If you're, you probably wouldn't remember if you're only three up in Alaska at the world junior, they were unbelievable. And Sergei's reputation was going through the, the roof in the hockey circles. You know, I'm not sure the fans were, as into it as they would be today, you know, from social media, but, and, and the podcast and so on. But when Sergey came, we as a hockey group knew how good he was. And 
I remember Neil Smith talking and obviously Kenny Holland talking about him and Jimmy D talking about him. I mean, this guy had superstar written all over him. But when I saw him, when he came and then the fans got very excited, but this is a kid that came into Detroit as a night girl, couldn't speak a word of English. I remember he lived with Jimmy Light at his house for the first few weeks to get him, to get him into it. But the story I got was he was in bed. He put a couple of uh, pillows under his, uh, under his mattress and snuck out of the, uh, uh, snuck out of the hotel and Mr. Illich's private jet was waiting there for him. But then I read the Russian five book and it seemed to have a little bit of a different description on it than what I was told. So I'm not sure I would think Keith Dave knows what he's talking about in his book, but anyway, however it had turned out, he got there and, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was amazing. The energy and we were sort of an up and coming team and the Red Wings were popular and we were filling the Joe and, he, uh, I mean, look, from the very first game he played, he was a star. I mean, it wasn't any getting used to playing in the NHL. I think the fans really saw that. I mean, how the lateral mobility this guy had in his prime. I had him in Columbus late in his career. I brought him in just to try to help me deal with Nikolai Zherdev and straighten his head out. And, you know, he was even good still then. And then he let, well, after Columbus, he went and played in Washington for two or three years. I mean, this guy had an unbelievable career he was that good did he ever become as good as i thought he would I, you know maybe not but he was just such a complete he wasn't the offensive superstar that a lot of us thought he would be but he was the most well-rounded two-way guy you could ever ever want to he was a dream guy to coach unbelievable from the time he was 19 until he was 35 so you guys added Chris Draper uh, at the end of the 93 season. So he played in the 94 season, I believe. Um, and everybody knows that he was the $1 guy. Um, how how did that sort of transpire? And, and, and did you guys really know that you were getting the Chris Draper we know now for an absolute steal? Well, it was kind of funny. Uh, I remember, I remember hearing, you know, Chris Draper had played on the Canadian Olympic team as a kid. He left the 67s, I believe, and he went and played with Team Canada with Dave King. And he ended up being a third round pick of the Winnipeg Jets. And people liked Drapes because he was a great skater, a great skater. And people thought he was going to be, you know, an, an okay NHLer. But he, he sort of, he sort of started off with a bit of a thud in his career and played a few games early in Winnipeg and then ended up in the minors. So I was GM uh, looking after Adirondack at the time as well in, in our farm team. And Jim Clark was a part-time scout for us in the Maritimes and is now director of pro uh, scouting for Ottawa and has been since he was with me in Columbus. So Jimmy phoned me in the summer. He said, Doug, we got to we got to take a look at trying to sign uh, this Draper kid. Played Moncton this year with the Hawks. He said, "I don't know if he's going to be an NHLer. I, I, you know, I'm not saying he's going to be an NHLer, but he can skate. He's got a he, he's got a chance to be an NHLer, and he would be great in Adirondack." So that was Jim Clark that told me to sign him. And uh, I phoned uh, Mike Smith, and Mike Smith said to me. Doug, he said, I love Draper. Mike was the GM of Winnipeg. Then he said, I love Draper. But he said, our coach does not like him at all. And that was John Paddock. You know, lots of coaches like guys, you know, like different guys. Paddock just didn't like him. And he said, I, I really like Draper. And I want to give him a chance with another organization. So I'll trade him. I'll trade him to you for future considerations. In other words, I'll give him to you is what the deal was. He would right. give him to me. So that was fine. We did the deal based on future considerations. And you used to be able to fake it a little bit. So then the NHL came back to us in the phone and said, oh, no, we need something. What is it? What's the deal? It can't just be future considerations. So uh, Mike and I agreed uh, it would be a dollar. And I actually gave him the dollar at the draft or wow. the next time I saw him. So we did the deal. Drapes comes to training camp. And he was good. He was good in training camp, but he wasn't good enough to make the team. So we sent him to Adirondack and he decided uh, he wanted to go back to Toronto and reevaluate his hockey career, whether he really wanted to do that, go to the minors. So I phoned uh, Newell Brown, who was, I just had hired Newell to be our coach in Adirondack. And I said, Hey, Newell, you got to get on the horn and talk to Draper and get him to report. We need him in Adirondack, desperately need him in Adirondack. And this guy's got a chance to be a good player. So Newell actually talked him into going. 
And he started off and just played unbelievable. And then in January, Scotty and I go to Hamilton. Bowman was the head coach then, and I was assistant GM. So I went to uh, Hamilton with Scotty, and Draper had a hat trick that night. And we, he got called up that game. After that game, he got called up to Detroit, and he played 1,176 games after that with the Red Wings. And what did he win? Three or four cups. I mean, it was a great, it was a, it's a great story now, but I mean, it, and th- this guy was, I mean, he became a heart and soul guy with that, you know, with that grind line and with McCarty and LaPointe and Malty. I mean, they were so important. So it was a great story, but it was really, you know, I get credit for, well, Brian Murray mostly gets credit. Every time I see it written up, Brian Murray made that trade, but uh, I remember listening to Jimmy D one day recently and he said that I had made it. So I uh, finally got credit for it. I don't need credit. I'm old and retired, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> of course. It just took a little <laughs> bit of time. Just a little but time. I got another story. I got another story, too, is Timmy Taylor. This is, a, this is a equally as good a story. So I, I coached Timmy Taylor in Baltimore. Timmy Taylor was a second-round pick of the Washington Capitals. So he comes in, played for me in Baltimore in the American Idol League, and had 27 goals, if I'm not mistaken, as a rookie. And then he... I left Baltimore and, and uh, went to Detroit and Timmy sort of floundered. And then I'm sitting about two or three years later in the, in the stands in Glens Falls at Arondack's rink. And Timmy comes over and sits me and says, I'm playing for Hamilton, Vancouver's farm team. And I, I really don't think they're going to sign me back. And he said, geez, I'd like to get a job. So I said to him, I said, Timmy, here's the deal. And I love this kid. I liked him as a guy and I liked, liked him as a player. And I said, you, if you don't get a deal, you phone me this summer and I'll sign you in Adirondack. So he phone, I get a call mid July and, and we signed Timmy to a contract. And he, he was a star with Draper in Adirondack that year. And he got called up and uh, he had a great career in the NHL, winning a couple of cups. And, and now uh, he's an important management guy in St. Louis. But Timmy, Timmy was another uh, great pickup for Adirondack and for Detroit that summer. So it was kind of a fun, fun year. Yeah, I think he had over a hundred points that year with Adirondack. Oh yeah, yeah. He and then had a good, great NHL career after in Detroit and Tampa. You know, I mean, he he really was captain in Tampa. So it was it was a good summer for us picking up some uh, you know some good solid young guys that were twenty two, twenty three years of age. So. You go from having to build an AHL team with the Red Wings to about four years later, basically having to build an entire NHL organization from scratch. Because I believe it was 1998 you got hired by Columbus, correct? Yeah. 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 So obviously with an expansion team, the first few years, I think everybody knew going into it would be lean and they would be tough, not too dissimilar to what the Detroit Red Wings are going through now, uh, being at the bottom of the league. So one thing, the reason I bring this up is because back then it was a little different to how it is now, where if you were bad, you were basically guaranteed pretty close to where you should be picking. And a sore spot for Red Wings fans currently is the draft and more specifically the draft lottery. So what is your opinion on how the NHL is conducting the draft lottery these days? Well, I, I think back to that Columbus experience and I, I, it's a really frustrating one for me because I, I look at, uh, I look at where, you know, Vegas, where, how their lottery situation was. And when, when we came in Minnesota and I said, we were, we were the third and fourth team over a two year period. And it was, it was lean and it was ugly and every damn lottery I lost. I we I don't know if we ever jumped once in the lottery in, in my seven or so years in, in in the in the draft in Columbus. I don't think we ever went up in the draft. We went up from third to one because we traded we traded up to get Nash and it was a trade, but every other year we lost the lottery. And I I'm, I'll never forget this. We go into Vancouver and we're playing in Vancouver. And we Nash and Jared ever playing unbelievable, and we beat the Canucks six two or something late, almost the last game of the season, and that moved us out of the pick. It dropped us down in the final standing. That loss and Washington slid into our spot because of that big win. And I remember driving to the airport the next morning, 
they're on the radio and they're going, oh my God, Columbus have got all these great young talent. They got, you know, Clash as a kid and Leclerc looks like he's going to be a great goalie. And Jared Evans is a star scoring 27 goals as a, as a 19 year old in the league. And Nash is getting 40 goals. It looks so great. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh man, it sounds pretty good. And it was a big win. So that move in the draft lottery, Washington moved into our spot. Washington won the lottery, moved to number one, and got Ovechkin with that pick. Now you tell me that 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 still pisses me off to this day that I was stupid enough not to lose that game. We should have lost that game in Vancouver, and maybe I'd still be working. That's so history changing. The lottery drives me. It's life changing. I got I got Alex Picard who couldn't play I mean, with the eighth <laughs> pick in that draft. But anyway. Uh, you know, at the lottery, I looked through recently the lottery and I go back to 95 and the five times it's been changed. And I don't get it. I mean, seriously, oh, they talk about tanking and I know some teams tank. But look, if you're bad enough to have to tank, don't you deserve to get a high pick? And I'm thinking like, I'm sorry, take the bottom five teams, take the bottom seven teams and, you know, let them figure it out let them let you know have a lottery amongst the five or seven give them better percentages give them a chance to get some to get the number one number two number three picks and let it go but they keep screwing around with it this year was like when do you watch a lottery show on tv an hour or an hour and a half show on tsn and sportsnet and you don't have a winner are you kidding me like what sport does that happen in that you have a lottery show when you're sitting there? The only reason you're watching the damn thing is to who's going to win number one, and they don't have a winner. Star, you know. So I'm thinking, like, how? And then they come up with this. I mean, like Stevie Y said it best. He said, "Well, it doesn't surprise me. The combination of those eight teams, the eight losers in round in the buy-in or the play-in." have a better chance of one of those eight have a better chance than we do. So like, I know they only had two and a half percent each, but do they not think that you've got to multiply them by eight and one of those eight, we're going to have a great chance to win it. Like it didn't make any sense to me, but anyway, they all decided on it and they're the geniuses. <laughs> how, how do you think the NHL and, and Bettman are feeling about the fact that a playoff team Got it. Because obviously they knew what this system was, but whether or not they fully comprehend, comprehended the odds of it. And now we're sitting here with the Detroit Red Wings at a 0% chance of Alexi Lafreniere, but somehow the Toronto Maple Leafs, Pittsburgh Penguins, Edmonton Oilers still have a chance. Do you think the NHL is happy about this outcome because they get a second lottery? Or do you think that they were kind of hoping this wouldn't happen and face the public backlash that they've got? Well, I you know what? I, I don't understand why they even went there, to be honest. So, you know, they, they knew it was a possibility. Did they think, I guess you would say, well, you don't expect Toronto to win it because they have a two and a half percent chance to win it. But they did. But now they've got a twelve and a half percent chance to win the number one pick. You know, that's the now going into this one of eight, you know. They've got a 12.5% chance all of a sudden to win it. So I don't know how they let it happen. I really don't. But they knew it, and they're, you know, they've are you been through it. And uh, I, as somebody said to me the other day, like, I've given up on this lottery. Like, seriously. I, I lived through the one when, when they had to do the fancy lottery because it was Sid Crosby, and we had the lockout year. And I'm sitting in Columbus with a horrible team. And, and, uh, and every, and I'm sitting at board of governors meetings and the argument was, well, everybody deserves a chance to get Sid Crosby. Like, are you kidding me? Everybody gets a chance. And then they come with, I got us in Pittsburgh and two or three other teams had three balls in that damn lottery and everybody else had the best teams in the league had one ball and the other teams had two balls. So you had a minimal chance to get Sid. I ended up picking six in that draft. And and he goes to Pittsburgh, and what's he done in 15 years in Pittsburgh? Like, seriously. He yeah, made not a, a, lot not of a whole lot really, to write home about. Yeah, he's I made a lot of guys really smart. But anyway, I'm not bitter, you know? So when those conversations are <laughs> taking place, um, 
does everyone sort of have the same weight at the table or do you find that the high earning teams kind of have a bigger stick than uh, the smaller market teams? Well, I, I think it's, you know, the experienced GMs um, have a, have a lot of say, but a lot of times what happens at the board of governors level in particular is the executive group of the board of governors, which is five or six key guys. I mean, key owners, like, Obviously, uh, you know, bought Jacobs with the Bruins. And, you know, there, when I was there, it was Jacobs, it was Snyder, it was three or four high powered owners. And they, Batman and his group, he and Daly and, and their and their management team would really present the proposals to the executive committee. The executive committee would then pass it or whatever, and then it would come to the board of governors. So it was, look, it, they, 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 they've got a, it's a tough job. They've got a lot of tough decisions to make and they do a, a, re, a, a really good job considering, but the lottery is one thing to me that they, they have missed on because to me, the lousy team should get the players and it, that's the idea of a lottery. And I think they've sort of missed it on that. When you go into a lottery and you've got an 18% chance of winning it and you're the worst team in the league, or an 18.5% chance of winning it, and you're the worst team in the league. I, I don't like those odds. Simple as that. So they they do. You know what? I, I happen to, you know, I, I have a lot of time for them. They do. They've done a lot of good work. I like Gary's a friend of mine. I mean, I've criticized him when when I think he deserves to be criticized, but I still I still respect the fact that he's done a pretty good job in the league, and so is Bill Daly. So. You know, doesn't mean I can't, still can't criticize them once in a while. All right. So if I grant you all encompassing power over the NHL and I give you full control to reform how the draft order is determined, what is Doug McLean's answer? I would just take the bottom five teams and, and they would have if they would have overwhelming odds to get the top five picks of the draft. That's how I would do it. And, you know, maybe a guy team a team can move down one spot how it originally was and maybe move up one spot or something so that there's limited movement, but there's still a chance that you can have a little intrigue to it. But to me, you know, the bottom five teams of the league, you know, we got to, we, the league is different today than when I was in it because the teams are much more, it's closer, you know, it's, it's much more, there's much more parity because of the cap and because of the, the way it's all structured salary wise. So, you know, I, I but I still think the bottom five teams need to help, but not as much as it it did when when we were struggling. I mean, look, my my first year in Detroit or in Columbus, we played Detroit eight times, eight times we played the Red Wings, and my payroll was seventeen million and theirs was seventy million. Now you tell me that made sense? That was those games were a lot of fun for us. Can you imagine? <laughs> oh, Serious Red Wings fans. <laughs> oh yeah, it was great. It, was great. <laughs> it might have been points yeah. night for the Red Wings players. Yeah, tell me about it. Anyway, but that's the way it was, and you know the lottery then was. But today it's more, you know, it, it's much closer. I mean, look, there's very little discrepancy, but you still have bad teams that need help. You know. So uh, the Red Wings, speaking of bad teams that need help, uh, Red Wings fans right now are going through or have been in uh, a little bit of an unfamiliar time, you know, 25 years of success and now being one of the worst teams in the NHL again. Um, Steve Eisenman returning home to to Hockey Town has been a big storyline and, and people are looking to draw parallels. And one thing that I wanted to touch on was uh, you said when Steve Eisenman was a young captain, uh, he struggled. Do you think that's playing into his apprehension or delaying naming a captain for the Red Wings, presumably Dylan Larkin? No, I mean, he was named captain at 23, and, and really, I wasn't there when it happened. But, you know, I mean, he, he was obviously the guy. I mean, he came in and was a star from day one. Um, I don't know if he was ready to be captain at that time, but, it, you know, it's, you always say, well, I'm going to go with my best player. I, I think he's probably doesn't want to put too much pressure on Larkin. I think it wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me that he had let, he liked that Larkin to have a little less on his shoulders than just, you know, leading the team on the ice, but to have to be the guy off the ice is, is maybe a little too much for him. Maybe Stevie's thinking that maybe, I don't know. 
Stevie. I don't know a lot with Stevie singing because he doesn't say a whole lot. Uh, he's pretty low key when he's he going about his business. But you know, it wouldn't surprise me that may have somebody. Else, but Larkin is probably the obvious choice unless somebody really jumps to the forefront. I don't see it right now when I look at their roster. Anybody jumping up and taking a hold of that, but I don't know them as well as, as you guys do as, as the inside on them. All right. So we've talked a lot um, from the management perspective with you here. So before we let you go, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask for a little bit of insight on the coaching situation in Detroit, given that's what you did for a good chunk of your career. So in regards to Blash Hill, what I'm curious about is, He's never had a good team. And when you talk to the fan base, they're split on whether or not he's a good coach or a bad coach because he's never been given a fair shake. From a former coach's standpoint, how do you sympathize or empathize with the situation Jeff Blashill is in with this team in the state that it is? Well, you know, and I, I feel for him, look, uh, you know, Babcock left at, at the perfect time, really. He knew, he knew, and Kenny knew that they were going to hit some tough times. There's no doubt about that. It, it was coming, and it was, and it was going to come hard. You know, with Lidstrom, I, I remember saying, uh, doing it on Hockey Central noon one day. Somebody's telling me that Lidstrom, you know, he and Babcock were not really tight at the end. There's no denying that. And, Bab, and Lidstrom was coaching the Bantam team over in Sweden his first year retired, and I suggested to the fans that they send Babcock over to coach the Bantam team and bring Lidstrom back to play for the Red Wings. And they'd probably be better off both teams, you know? So I, I just think it, it everybody knew it was going to come. Did I think they would be this bad? No, I didn't. I didn't really think they'd be this bad, but when I look at their roster and I look at it, what they're faced with, even today, they got the fourth overall pick. They're going to get a good player. One of, probably three guys. Uh, I'm not sure who they'll, who they'll go with, but whether it's Drysdale, whether it's Sanderson, whether it's, you know, whoever, you know, there's a three or four of them that are rated right there in that spot, pretty close. So I think they've got a long way to go, but what scares me most, Blashill to me is a good, solid guy. I, I happen to really like him and I think he's, he's done a solid job, but I think there becomes a, it comes a time where, you have to make a change. And, and I, I really thought they would make a change this year, but Stevie, you know, Stevie knows they're going to be bad again. And why would he bring in the guy that's going to be their future coach right now? I, I thought Gerard Glant would be a natural there. Uh, it didn't happen. Uh, I guess because Stevie doesn't feel they're ready to make that move and Flash might as well stay in there. I mean, he is a good coach and he's a solid guy and he gets the program, but it's going to be a tough year. It's going to be a tough year. And I'll tell you, the one the number one thing I look at every day when I look at their roster is who's going to play goal for this team and who's going to give them a chance to win with their goaltending. And Howard has been, you know, has struggled. He hasn't, you know, he hasn't been great, but he has had a good, decent career. And then you look at Bernier and I'm thinking, wow, where are they headed in goal? And, who do they have coming in the future? You guys know probably better than I do, but I, I see goaltending and the back end. And I mean, they got three or four kids up front, but after that, it's pretty thin. Yeah. We, nobody in the Red Wings organization knows where they're going with goaltending right now. There's not a lot there. Yeah, right. um, I'm glad you brought up Gerard Gallant though. Cause I actually did want to ask about him because you were the first one, I believe to give him, uh, head coaching job in the NHL with uh, Columbus back in 04. Um, one of the thoughts that was going around uh, Red Wings media was obviously with Blashill having the opt-out in his contract or Eisenman having the opt-out in Blashill's contract this year was that Eisenman played with Gallant and he was he's widely viewed as one of the best coaches in the NHL. Of course, they would bring him in. But would Gallant be the guy to come in and coach a bad team? Or is he the guy that comes in and, and closes it out? So once you get good, you bring up Gallant in to win the cup. You know him better than most people. Would he be a good fit to come into a rebuild? Well, I, I, you know, that's what he's done. I mean, I, in Columbus, when I, you know, I hired him in Columbus in 2000 to be an assistant coach there. Um, 
you know, with Dave King, and it was really George's first year in the NHL, and he uh, first year as a coach in the NHL, and he was uh, became a head coach, and he wasn't really ready when I when I put him in as a head coach. He wasn't ready. He was, you know, still pretty green, but. You know, obviously, then he stepped back and became a good coach in junior, and then he went to Montreal and was real good as an assistant. And obviously, Vegas has done a tremendous job. I, I see him as a as a guy that's that's either way. I, I think maybe he's better suited for an average team to take them to the next level. He's never. I've no. I don't know with being a top team. You know, I still think he. I just think he's a solid coach. I think he's. You know the players respect him. He's he's not easy on them. He's he's good. He's a he's a player's coach, but he can also be tough. He's got a good feel for the game. He's not a BSer. The players respect him because he's a straight shooter. I I think he's a good fit with a rebuild, and I think he's a good fit with a good team. So you know, I know he was in the running for Jersey. Looks like Lindy Ruff may get that job. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't talked to him since I've been home. Um, I haven't been out much here since I'm in quarantine here, so I uh, I haven't sent it, talked to him. But I, you know, I he's got another year in his deal with Vegas, so I'm not sure. You know, he may he may go somewhere this year, but he may sit the year out. I don't know. Well, if you ever want him to, uh, or if he ever feels like getting on the air, I'm sure we'd love to have him on as well. Um, you have a book coming out uh, next October, and I think if we go any longer, we'll spoil the entire thing. So uh, we'll call it here. <laughs> uh, Doug, thank you so much. Uh, maybe when draft day comes out, we'll have you back on to talk about it a little bit more, and we'll give away a few copies. But in the meantime, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Doug McLean, this has been an amazing interview. Um, hope you have a good rest of your summer, and thanks for coming on the Winged Wheel Podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys, and good good luck with the podcast, and good luck to the Red Wings. That was our interview with Doug McLean. Uh, we really appreciate Doug coming on. We're looking forward to his book in October of 2021. If it's uh, anything like the stories he just told us, and like I said, we had to we had to stop asking questions unless we spoil the entire book. So, a lot of fun stuff in there. Yeah, it was a great interview, and uh, he was very candid with his answers, and I really appreciate that. But you know, he didn't sugarcoat anything. What would the NHL look like these days if Alex Ovechkin was there wearing a different red, white, and blue jersey? What did he say? I should have lost that game. If I lost that game, I'd still be working. <laughs> <laughs> so for anybody else who ever has this like rose color view of the world who says, no, GMs never talk about tanking, there you go. <laughs> There's Doug McClain who does the same thing that we do and says, well, if we just lost that, we would have had this player and our franchise would have been turned around. And GMs also hate the draft lottery. I, I've i never felt so validated, honestly. Oh, he went. He was passionate. Oh, he was. Yeah, and it, it was stupid. And again, you feel bad for Columbus because, again, I went back and looked through it. Yeah, they, they got screwed. Like, no wonder. Not The draft lottery was dramatically different back then from what it is now, but it was still a lottery. No wonder Columbus had such a hard time pulling themselves out from where they were because, yeah, they missed on some picks, but, man, they kept getting bounced every year, every year. And if if you really want to go down a dark rabbit hole, look at some of the players that were taken, like, one, two, three picks ahead of where they were. Oh, man, what was it? In uh, 05, they had the pick that was directly after Carey Price? <laughs> like, Yeah. It seems um, like a Carey Price I, guy, too. I mean, well, yeah, there was a story of him passing on Kopitar because he didn't like his the way he worked. So, I mean, how, did they even one? have gyms in Slovenia? Well, no, he like ran like he carried like buckets of water. So it was just like a very like run up a mountain workout, and that's why he took Gilbert Brule. Oh, which we all know how that would turn out. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it it was a fun perspective seeing it from that way. I loved the Stevie story that he told. <laughs> I wish I just had one good coach. Yep. Thanks. That's what we lose sight of with Stevie's a GM. He's so like stoic, but then you forget how animated he was as a player. Oh yeah. At least early in his career. Yeah, he still was towards the end. You could you could see he was the type of, he's he was the Evan of the Red Wings. He didn't say much, but when he did, it it packed. He made it count. That's what the prophet of truth does. Evan, uh what's your jersey number? Uh sixty nine? No, wait, sixty seven. <laughs> If we get podcast jerseys like for us three, are you getting 69 or 67? Can I get 69 and 420 on it? 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we could do that. The name bar is the one making. The name I'll bar never wear. I would never wear a 69, actually. Oh, and I would never wear double zeros either. You think you know somebody? So yeah. six, 67. Let's try and break this down. Is he just a real big fan of Max Pacioretty, or is this a troll on the Leafs? I think he thinks he's one better than Mario Lemieux. Yes, also true. <laughs> um. Yeah, so that, that was a, a fun interview. Um, let us know what you guys thought, what your favorite part of it was. I just love like the the behind the scenes looks that you get. Like just the, oh, yeah, yeah. If you don't get a contract, come talk to me and I'll sign you over in Adirondack. Like you don't hear about that stuff. Anyways, um, good uh, good conversation to have. We were, we're definitely going to have him back. But moving on now, some Red, Wing, Red Wings relevant news or I guess I don't know. I don't even know if to call this news anymore. Do you have another player who's rumored to be going back to the KHL because he doesn't have a contract yet? And it's like, do we buy it this time? We do not. Is Evgeny, Svechnikov, is Evgeny Svechnikov actually going to go? How do you handle this one? I don't. I don't. I wouldn't put it out of the realm of possibility, especially considering when is the KHL going to start back up? Are there going to be out clauses? Is this just kind of one of those procedural things? He needs ice time because he has not played a ton of meaningful minutes over the past you know, 24 months. Does he need better recovery? This and that. Sure, all of that's relevant, especially considering his major reconstructive knee surgery. This is important. This is basically the make it or break it stage in Evgeny Sveshnikov's career. That said... If this is an angle for like a guarantee that he's going to make the team, if this is an angle for ice time, if this is an angle for whatever, then if it's real, like if it's real, because I don't even know whether to trust these reports. There's nothing, there's been nothing to corroborate it that I've seen that hasn't just been like another Russian link that's based off the first Russian link, which is seems to happen a lot. Um, well, he doesn't have much leverage, does he? He hasn't. Anything. Forget leverage. It would just be, from his standpoint, absolutely stupid to go now. If we're having this conversation next summer, yeah, depending on how his season went, there could be a million reasons why he should go. But this is the first year he's not waiver eligible. So for all intents and purposes, he's basically guaranteed a spot on the Red Wings. And if he's not, that means he goes through waivers and he's a former first round pick another team will take a chance on him. So he's either going to play for the Red Wings this year, or he's going to play for another NHL team. And maybe it goes better there. Maybe he gets a shot. Like, this is his year. He's getting a shot in the NHL. And if this year goes completely sideways, of course he should run back to the KHL then, because they would pay him infinity dollars because he's a former first-round pick. He's Russian, yada, yada, yada. He would do tremendous step back there. But, this isn't the time to go. Any good agent, any, I'm not even saying good agent, any agent with basic common sense will go, this is your year to prove it in the NHL. And whether or not you deserve it, it doesn't matter. The way the system is structured is you are playing in the NHL this year, or they send you to the minors. Every, all 31 teams in the NHL say, nah, and then, then you go to the K. Because if, if the Red Wings send him to Grand Rapids this year, yeah, if I'm him, I'm on the first plane back to Moscow. But if they keep him on the Red Wings, would you not want to prove that you can play in the NHL? I would think that's where his mindset would be. And let's not forget, too, he's not your, uh, I don't even want to say typical because it's getting very common these days. But he's not that Russian that stayed over in Russia until he was 21, 22. He's been playing hockey in North America since he was 16. He has not had any homesickness to any severe severe degree because he, he's been here for six years already six seven years already so yeah he's i don't think he's the biggest flight risk and if he is this is not the time yeah i i again i don't put too much weight in this i don't hold anything against evgeny right now in terms of like opinion of whether or not he should be doing this i don't even it's just not something i can pay a lot of mind to i know it's hypocritical we're talking about it on the podcast but people have asked and it's come up over the past week so it's just another one of those things where you just kind of have to lay in wait you it's always impossible to know for sure but you start to recognize a pattern of like what's being 
planted in the media by agents, what is just being baselessly reported by a league or a news source that covers the KHL and not the NHL. So it's in their best interest to generate this kind of buzz. There's not really a lot of onus on them to make sure it's accurate. And we've seen multiple, multiple times, especially relevant to Red Wings signings and departures, things be inaccurate in terms of, um, you know, non uh, team centric or NHL centric reporting. So anyhow, we'll see what comes up with that. Uh, just add that to the pile of like Red Wings, you know, situations that uh, Eisman and Blashill have to um, decide about over the coming, I mean, now forever, because when are we actually going to have hockey back? This whole cap conversation, we never talked about something. Johan Franzen, whenever they do the flip over. So I know they extended all expiring contracts through uh, to the fall whether they did that for the LTIR contracts, I, I don't know. But for all intents and purposes, uh, Johan Franzen's contract is off the books. It is no longer uh, part of the Red Wings um, binder, so to say. It's not on the LTIR, LTIR column anymore. That's LTIR space that's freed up. So uh, that is Johan Franzen's career with the Red Wings officially, officially ended. Sad. And I just always think back to his nine goals in four games against Colorado. Oh, that was magical. That was one hell yeah. of a run. And I mean, it's just a paper move. And and it looks like Johan still struggling with the concussions, but at least he's on the right track now, I guess. Uh, his Instagram has seen some traction over the last couple of months. Not a lot, but more than we saw before. So it's something. Um, yeah, it's, I mean... I hope he comes back to the organization in some capacity, but I, I wouldn't bet on it. Uh, I just hope the guy has a a happy, healthy life. He deserves it at this point. Um, I went back the other day and, and, you know, looked up some of the old stuff that came out not terribly long ago about what ba- uh, Babcock did hit to him specifically and it just pissed me off so much. It made me so angry. And then I watched his nine goals in four games against Colorado. And you feel better. So do you think he, do you think he gets, um, you know, a cut of all of the uh, ticket sales at the Pepsi Center in Colorado because <laughs> he owns the team now. <laughs> he should. If he doesn't, he absolutely should. Uh, okay. With that, uh, I know we had the interview. So uh, still lots to talk about. We will be talking about the CBA more. We will be talking about cap targets more. We're going to get back into concerted prospect talk Um we do have a plan, like we have this mapped out for the summer. We're going to keep doing our prospect profiles. Um, we're not only going to be talking about the fourth overall pick, so a lot of these profiles are going to be guys that might be relevant to the Red Wings at pick 32 and beyond. Um, don't worry, there's going to be a lot of conversation about Raymond, Rossi, Drysdale, Perfetti. Yes, we'll do Askarov. Yes, we'll still do Stutzel and, and Byfield because they might drop. Like all those conversations are going to be happening. Um, we're going to be doing multiple deep dives, multiple rankings. We're going to continue our mock drafts. Um, that's all to come. So that's what you guys have to look forward to. Um, but for now, unless either of you have anything um, in specific. Oh, actually, very quickly, uh, stuff about phase three and four of the NHL return to play is coming out right now. Um, like literally as we started recording. So, um, a lot of that has to do with parameters around, uh, punishment for teams in case they break quarantine rules. Oh, I didn't so, see that before I hopped on the computer. Yeah. Return. So I'm going to be quoting Elliot Friedman here on Twitter. Uh, return to play stage four states, individuals leaving without permission may be subject to consequences. And this is kind of paraphrased consequences up to and including removal. In addition, violations will result in, uh, for clubs, significant penalties, potentially including fines and or loss of draft choices. And then it talks about stage three, all the pre-medical stuff that they're going to have to do, continual testing, consultations with doctors and infectious disease experts uh, to to assess risk and everything, to decide whether or not they play. They talk about, you know, if the NHL decides to cancel things or make a decision one way or another, the NHLPA can protest it. Um, they're really, really restricting things. And I think a lot of this verbiage coming out now has a lot to do with um the four st louis blues players and personnel who got uh who contracted covid19 from a bar and uh, jake for partying um in vancouver things like that so they're they're looking at this right now and they're thinking 
we cannot afford to mess this up. We can't afford four players or four personnel from a cup favorite to be going out to bars right now. We just don't have that luxury. Um, Let, let's be clear. And it's doable because, okay, look at Formula One. They all travel to a different country. They're in Austria right now. They had a race earlier today. And they had to be clean. They had to be like they they had to make sure they were able to do this race. They were all there early. They were quarantined. They ran four thousand tests in advance of this race. In the advance of this race, every single person came back negative. It's doable. And here's the thing too. The NHL is banking on getting a. Uh, I think the exact calculation is in ass ton of advertising revenue from the playoffs here it takes literally one moron to burn this all to the ground because if someone from the canucks goes out to a bar catches corona comes back in he's coughing all over the arena Someone from the team that they're playing comes in contact with. He breathes on a Minnesota Wild player. A, a player from the game that's coming after them, because they're all playing out of the same arena, touches something he coughed on in the arena. Now Corona's going through his whole team. This is how a disease works, and it's happening on a global scale right now, so it does not take a lot for a bubble to get blown up. It So you can see why they're being super restrictive. Yeah, they're this. talking about fines, losing draft picks, all that stuff. Good, great. Find the like find them out the ass because obviously it's on the player to not do things stupid, but like every organization is from the top down. So if your players are getting out of the bubble, it's on the general manager. If it's like, it's top down, like at my work, I am responsible for the stupid shit. My employees do, even if I don't do it because if they did, it means I didn't do my job right to prevent them from doing it. So Little do you know, Brad, when you're not looking, I go into your uh, store and, and I rub grease on the ground where you and your employees stand. That explains a lot. Anyways. Yeah. I'm just trying to get you a workers' comp payout, man. Hey, man. Yeah. More time to do uh, work on the podcast from home if I literally can't walk. But <laughs> I always – um oh, sorry. No, no. I was going to say uh, I've pretty much done my, my rant about NHL players trying to avoid the stupidity. Completely unrelated. I love when I can see Evan pick up his phone and his eyes get a little bit wide, and I like to try to guess what he saw. The blinding I'm, light. Wh- yeah, one of these days I'm going to send him a picture of my butt. <laughs> just like I'm going to pre-take it, and then I'm just going to like hit send as I'm talking, so he won't know it's coming from me, and just see how he reacts. My, my, it's funny you mentioned that because when you were talking about how you set up that uh, group chat for us on Twitter, so that we can just uh, share and save any relevant tweets in there so that when we're talking about him during the episode we have quick reference uh, my first thought was oh i can post so much stupid shit in there just so you have to read through it <laughs> i will be so angry if i have to just like move mountains to get a reply from you in our messenger chat and you're sending memes on twitter <laughs> i will be so <laughs> upset it won't even be like a oh ha, ha brad's so silly i'll be like just punching the air the entire time <laughs> all right uh with that before the um the angry reviewers we're gonna uh, come at us we're gonna be moving on uh away from this uh, phase three and four talk and over to overtime and uh, we're gonna start with our amazing patreon uh comments um ooh, we uh we sent out a lot of cool patreon gear today so i mean it's gonna take forever to f- fulfill because thanks for nothing covid um but it's cool stuff uh, we're gonna start with Dylan Krill. He says, "Did you guys hear that Perfetti can solve a Rubik's cube in under a minute? We have to pick him now, right?" Anyways, what's a secret talent we don't know about you guys? Ah, interesting. Oh man, here's where my stupidity is really gonna shine. I'm decent at golf. Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> go for it, Brad. I don't have anything. You go. I gotta think. I uh. I'm going to do a brag here and know that I say this knowing how terrible I am in so many other ways, but I have still insanely good reflexes. I don't know what it is, but my reflexes are just... That means you're a dad and you just don't know it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Catch a baby. I'm excited. I heard babies just like roll off changing tables for no reason. Oh, I physically caught Mika by the ankle before like a fish. It was... That's the dream. It it happens and then like, you know... 
you hope nobody saw it because, you know, you don't want to look like bad parents. <laughs> you let them roll off a chain. Yeah, table. exactly. It's only happened to me once. Shut up. Uh, Brad, what's your secret? Do you have a secret talent? I don't have a secret talent. I Like, my, my best talents are all sports related. Like... Uh, if I'm if I get to break a bit, I'm that guy that you teach me a sport and within a week, I'm at least half decent of it. Like basketball, golf, baseball, football. I picked up on all of them very what about quickly. Polo? I'm sure I could. <laughs> like I, I've not. Yes, he'd have to get a very small horse. <laughs> it, <laughs> we'll get him a, a little miniature donkey. Yeah, a donkey, yeah. A donkey would be great. Um, I, I don't know. That's my talent. Like it doesn't really matter the sport. I've I always been pretty good if only my physical dimensions allowed me to excel at some of these other sports but yeah uh, I'll, I'll go with that since i don't have any like i'm not able to solve a rubik's cube or anything cool like that i'll say that brad's recall is fr- it's fr- it's messed oh up. yeah my, i got a good freakish memory. like i my recall is notably bad especially when i'm talking about something specific i'll be like what's that actor's name Will Smith. And it'll be so obvious and my brain will just be like, oh, you want this? I'm taking it away from yes. you. And Brad's like, oh, what was the extra in like uh, an unaired Will Smith pilot in the third minute in? And he'll like tell you what his mother's maiden name is. And it's like, all right, weirdo. <laughs> I don't even try. Um, like, honestly, I don't even try to research this crap. I just see it once and it just sticks. It makes no sense. Uh, Sid Fullis says... Uh, What's your favorite Mickeyism? I remember Jordan Tutu running a guy, uh, running a guy over to Mickey, chuckling and saying that Tutu is built like a fire hydrant. Still makes me laugh just thinking about it. Do you guys have one? Uh, my Mickeyism, my favorite Mickeyisms are the ones he doesn't say. The one where you know what he's thinking, and yeah. and you can hear him trying to not say it, even though he so desperately wants to. Those are my favorite Mickeyisms. It's. It's always like, well, no, it's, well, I mean, well, you know, he just kind of trails off. Like, yeah. he's like, hey, you know what I'm about to say? <laughs> he's like, I, I wouldn't be saying bull crap. Or, you know, I'll just... or like, he'll get that little Mickey chuckle. Like, oh, the players probably think it. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like when he just is so excited. He just shouts over Ken Daniels. <laughs> Ken Daniels would be like, big hit. And Mickey would be like, oh, <laughs> He does. He loves a good scream. Yeah, I love it. I don't. If you're gonna have a a biased co- color commentator, which I think for a team network, that's what you have to have. Are Ken and Mick not the perfect blend of just like good hockey commentary and like the right amount of it's an oxymoron, but objective bias for your team? Oh yeah, they're the best. They have and, a good and- sprinkling of homerism. And yeah. and they have no problems dumping on the wings like they're playing when they're playing like crap. So it's refreshingly honest too. Um, Haroon Khan says, "Hey boys, what's the deal with people not liking Chris Illich?" So this one's actually, um, I think, no matter what happened with this coming in, Chris Illich was taking over. Um, I mean, publicly, he was de facto running the team for some time, but taking over publicly from Mike Illich in a period where the Red Wings were mired with bad play that was born specifically of bad contracts that are very heavily rumored to be uh, at the direction of ownership to try to keep a a championship run alive. So um, you no longer have the the affinity for the owner that the fan base had with Mike Illich, who served the team so well for so many years. Um, And then they have a resentment for ownership because of this bad situation that the team is in now, whether or not you agree with their decision to extend the playoff streak. And then, uh, you know, new arena, higher ticket prices, it's just not a lot there for him to kind of build public image right now in my mind. Yeah. He wasn't going to come out shining no matter what happened here. He was taking over from one of the most beloved owners in sports history uh, from a period of 25 straight playoffs into what everybody could see was coming just utter sheer and misery i mean you can you can nitpick some of the things like the red wings were one of the last teams to make a statement on the whole blm movement the what's going on with the district around the arena that was promised is a very very justifiable criticism more like district nine than district detroit yeah (laughs) right so it's there the reasons fans don't like Chris Illich in my mind are very unjustified, but there are definitely a few things in there that we could 
point out and go, yeah, that ain't right. Um, da, 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 moving on here. Ryan Kern says, guys, I listen to like four hockey podcasts, and this is the only one that consistently pronounces Lafreniere uh, with the R. I cringe every time. Why don't more hockey writers listen to you guys? Yeah, why don't they? Um, I can think of a few to reasons. To be fair, it still might be Lafreniere. Instead of Lafreniere, it might be a little bit of a difference. But, yeah, the R is definitely pronounced as Brad has. Yeah, it could be Lafreniere, Lafreniere. It doesn't matter. It's not Lafreniere. Um, Drunky the Dwarf, and he messaged me before, says this is – I have to try to make sense of this one. I feel like we're just too stupid to have the NHL come back with the report of uh, four Blues players getting – uh, testing positive from going to a bar. I feel like we're just going to firk it up. So in that case, what happens to the lottery? So we get this question quite a bit. What happens in the lottery if the NHL does not come back is that the teams ranked uh, 18th to 25th in terms of win percentage at the end of the season or like at the end of play, those are the ones that are going to be uh, entered into the second lottery. So the second lottery for Lafreniere still happens, and it's going to be Montreal, Chicago, Arizona, Minnesota, Winnipeg, New York, Florida, and Columbus in this uh, Lafreniere lottery, and they all get the one in eight lots, odds. So um, that's the benefit that they get if this doesn't come back. So the teams above them are, I'm not going to say screw, they were never, they should never have been involved in the lottery in the first place. Uh, so the only thing that changes that is if a couple of those teams pull an upset. Essentially. Yeah. Well, because if the oh, season's canceled, yeah, in case if, they make it yeah, through. If the season's canceled, yeah. it's those teams. If the play-ins go on, they would have to win to be out of the lottery. And then this next part of the comment is: if you could only pick one league to draft from for the next ten years, all picks through all seven rounds, who would you choose? Uh, or what league? I'm gonna play the numbers here and go with the OHL. They yes. produce the most volume of players because out of all the leagues, they draw from the biggest. Uh, well, close to the biggest population of hockey players. So yes. it's not that, again, not to dump on the other leagues. It's, this is just pure numbers. Uh, Yak, or sorry, <laughs> Sleeve McDykel <laughs> says, <laughs> ever since you guys have completed Wednesday's mock draft and Evan predicted who he thinks the wings will pick, I'm convinced we'll actually be picking defensive center Anton Lindell. <laughs> Defense wins championships, I'll tell myself, and later we'll learn that we tried to move down for more picks, but there were no takers. He was just our guy. Reminds me of the Bobson Dugnut draft. <laughs> <laughs> how much would your heads explode in this scenario? I know anything is possible. Steve's going to do what he's going to do, but how unlikely is this scenario with the amount of talent in the top of this draft? I, I'm also sure, go ahead. Also, what pick would Steve have to make at four for you to launch him out of a trebuchet? I'm learning to stop worrying and love the rebuild. Remain untainted, coagulated milk protein receptacles. I don't think we have to worry about the Lundell scenario because if you want a defensive center, uh, there's one current uh, available ranked far higher than Lundell, which is Rossi. So if, if you like Lundell, let me tell you about Marco Rossi. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, okay, so... Basically, my list of players, assuming the top three is Lafreniere, Byfield, Stutzla, of players the Red Wings could pick where I wouldn't launch myself out a window is uh, Raymond, Rossi, Drysdale, Perfetti. I could even see the logic behind Askarov. That's the end of my list. Anybody off that, I am going to be deeply questioning it until proven otherwise like Mo Sider did. The only thing that I'll actually be say like, yeah, launch Eisman out of a trebuchet is if it was something like so freaking off the board, it was it's like worse than Mo Sider. Like if it's Jake Sanderson, I'll be like, ah, I really can't wrap my head around this one, but I'm not going to say fire the GM. I think that's a ridiculous thing to say when the players haven't even panned out yet. But if we're talking about like Mukamadoulin fourth overall, like something where he actually could have been had at 32, like without a question, then I'd be saying, oh, okay, well, I mean, maybe – Maybe someone's had a little bit too much today, you know, but that's it's it's just such a the possibility of Lundell is lower or is low and the possibility of Eisman picking someone that would actually make me say, oh, yeah, no, you know, get him out of Detroit is like close to zero. It's just not what happens. <laughs> he said confidently. <laughs> uh Oh, as foretold. Yakaruta says, uh. 
firstly, I realized something we may never pick this high again in the draft, so we better hit with this one. Secondly, I started looking at players with high cap hits on uh, other on teams at or near the cap. To me, there are two players the Wings should target, Ole Mata and Tyler Johnson. Mata would add a fairly young 26-year-old defenseman to the uh, team with a lot of experience. He could be pried away from Chicago easily. Johnson is older, but for $5 million, the Wings would uh, get a stopgap second-line center and an experienced third-line center for later down the line. Here's where the Red Wings have to be careful, and this is going to sound like the dumbest thing imaginable when I first say it, but then let me explain. The Red Wings have to be careful to not trade for a good player, because if they trade for a good player, then that is viewed as a good asset coming back despite the contract. What the Red Wings don't need right now is a 26 to 30 year old. What the Red Wings need right now is an 18 year old, which is a draft pick, which is a prospect. So as good as Tyler Johnson is and as much of an upgrade as he would be in the short term, the Red Wings do not need an upgrade in the short term. They need an upgrade in the long term, which is more likely for them to come from a prospect or the draft. Yeah, if they're allotting, you know, $5 million of this cap space, they need all of the value coming back in the deal to be in the picks slash prospects basket and none in the player that's coming back basket. Because even if that player has like minimal value, he will still be of use to the Red Wings who are just looking for warm bodies. Uh, example, almost all of Eisenman's moves last year, <laughs> except short of Robbie Fabry. Um, so, it's not a perfect rule. You're never going to get like that perfect scenario, but you don't want to be looking for the second line center. Not to say like you can't, they can't be had for, um, you can't have a great deal with those players. GMs do weird things. Um, but still, uh, Jordan Mills 22 says, Hey there, finally over the sentence falling in the lottery, even though the Wayne's got more hose than we did. So my condolences to you. The fact that Lafreniere is going to a playoff team is beyond absurd. Here's a fun little exercise for you guys. You have to make a trade with Ottawa one for one that benefits both teams. Try to make it. So it's either prospect for prospect or roster player for roster player. Interesting. Okay, so a mutually beneficial trade one for one between Ottawa and the Red Wings. Shabbat for that's tough. See, because you're tough. you're going immediately to roster players. I'm I'm combing through the prospects right now because I think that's where this is more likely to pick five. Mm, no, pick three this year for the Red Wings 2021 first round pick. Uh, yeah, yeah, I could see that. That could be fun. I was thinking if I'm Ottawa, I might take that risk. Drake Batherson. No, I don't think the Red Wings. Uh, actually, Drake Batherson for Dennis Chalosky. The Red Wings get a forward that they need. Ottawa gets a defenseman that they need. I would do need. that in a heartbeat. But I think Batherson's yeah. ceiling is a lot higher than Shalosky, so I don't think they do that. And, I don't think and I'm just thinking through Ottawa's forwards prospects. Logan Brown could be a bit of a reclamation project if they wanted. Maybe swap him for a... I, I don't even know who Detroit would be willing to give up for him. McIsaac, maybe? Alex Formanton for Shalosky. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I don't love Formanton. I think I prefer Chalosky, but I I could see how that's mutual. I think they're visual. way higher on Batherson. You, yeah, I, oh, but yeah. I think Formanton's younger. He is, I believe, but he's also more like a Darren Helm type. Not that he's not usable, but he was stupidly good on London. Yeah, but that's because he could skate. Everyone is than... stupidly good on London. That's because he could skate faster than everybody else in the league. <laughs> Uh, Scott O'Touche says, how do we think the flat cap affects our RFA negotiations? Do we look for po uh, possibly shorter contracts now? Uh, no, because it's a flat cap for a while. So um, if it was a flat cap for like one, two years, sure, I could I could see the logic behind that. With Mantha, you can't. Uh, with, well, actually, I'll say with Mantha and Bertuzzi, you can't. They're getting too close to unrestricted free agency. You either have to go one year with them or you got to go long term. To me, there's no sense going in between. Um, Fabry would make a lot of sense to go short term, but then you're running the risk of him repeating his performance and then costing you a lot more. 
Um, but yeah, so I, I think here's the thing. A flat cap is, is cost certainty. So uh, to me, I don't see how that affects how, how you view a player. If you believe in a player, lock them up long term because again, there's no question about what everything's going to look like. And quite honestly, it's a negotiating tactic to keep his cap hit down. Yeah, look for Eisman to work his voodoo on this one, and he's going to use a lot of things to leverage it. Um, in terms of like players' performances, the quarantine, or sorry, the uh, the reduced cap, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Hassam Al Qasem says, "What a great episode!" I assume next time Rowan should be a guest. Hey, man, Rowan's not in these comments. There's always you know these weird names that use Rowan's account. So maybe if we ever see him again. Uh, Chris Cannell says, Hey guys, I've been coming around on Perfetti, but I'm still with Brad on Lucas Raymond. Uh, he's an absolute dog on the puck. Since Brad has been struggling with a player comparison to Perfetti, I thought I'd give him a suggestion, suggestion. Barzal, uh, great hands, great playmakers, both can score, score goals, both can play at a fast pace, but effectively slow the game down. Also, do you guys legitimately think Askarov is in play at four? Is he in play? Yeah. Do I consider it likely? No, I think he's one of the least likely in play options, if not the least likely. Uh, I don't love the Barzal comparison. I like it from a few standpoints, but I mean, with Barzal, you're talking about a guy who just beat Connor McDavid for the league's fastest skater, and skating is Perfetti's biggest knock. So I, I have a hard time putting them apples to apples. Uh, Jake Nagy says, what are two ideal contracts we can take on this off season? Uh, if the new CBA is improved, anyone you think that can net us a first like Marlowe last year? Uh, I think you're looking at Vancouver, Tampa Bay's we'll, we'll be looking a little bit more into that. I mean, um, St. Louis, what's, what's more usable to you, a late first round pick or a potential starting goalie for me, if I am Steve Eiserman, my number one target is Louis Erickson, and I am doing everything in my power to get Thatcher Demko out of it. Uh, Michael Barry um, listed out a lot of good info for us here. I'm going to try to pick some out of it. He says, hi, guys. Hope all is well. Hope you enjoyed your Canada Day. Oh, happy uh, belated 4th of July and Canada Day to our listeners. Sorry about that. Uh, my two bad contracts I think we should definitely go for is uh, Louis Erickson from Vancouver and Jake Allen in St. Louis. Jake Allen has a year at 4.35 left, um, and they need to sign Vince Dunn and Petrangelo. Um, also doesn't have an NTC. Erickson has two years, $6 million cap hit per year. Um, only hitch is that he has a 15-team no-trade clause. Uh, however, hopefully since his contract was front-loaded with signing bonuses, he'd be more open to a buyout. Or Eisman could promise him playing time to get him to agree to waive the NTC. Those are... Erickson for me is like the poster boy because he has value in the player basket, but it's so washed out by how much that he'd have to be paid. And the fact that it's multiple years left as well. Vancouver's ownership wants a competitive team, especially with the stars they've been drafting. And th this you might be able to get them. And there were those rumors that uh, Louis had asked for a trade out of Vancouver. So I don't think that 15 team no trade clauses is going to come into play because him and his agent have to know his contract isn't going to a contender. So if he wants out of Vancouver, he knows this is the likely situation he's going to land in. James Phoenix says, good day, lads. Well, after days of watching Cole Perfetti highlights to gain a holistic view of his game, I have come around on my view of him and would be fine with him at number four. His intelligence, stick handling, and quick hands are definitely a commodity, and things like his skating and lack of physicality are attributes which can be taught or developed accordingly. Obviously, the Wings have a major ace to play with spare cap space that they have, so targeting contracts with potential yield should be the play they need to make. Always felt that Jake Allen... Goes on to talk about Jake Allen, lack of goalie depth with Jimmy possibly finishing up, plus the chance to take on a contract and get a pick or prospect like Cairo or uh, Costin could be rewarding. Um, and then mentions Petrangelo as well. Uh, anyways, I'm off now to try and work uh, whilst watching prospect reels of Raymond Drysdale and Rossi as they still can't accept the possibility of Byfield or Stutzla dropping down to us as at four as Zadina did so famously. Keep the faith as always in the hope that Eisenman will do good no matter what. Let's go Red Wings, you beautiful bastards. Uh, Joseph Fournier says, hey there, fellas, choo-choo, all aboard the Cole Perfetti train. I'm so ready. My palms are sweaty. Better than Nick Letty. Cooler than a Yeti. Don't forget he. Mom's spaghetti. Evan, did you write this? No. Don't forget he is definitely an Evan line. You won't be upsetty with Cole Perfetti. Choo-choo. Oh, Joseph. Had a few today, huh? <laughs> uh, 
It asks about uh, if the league completes some of the play-in rounds, but a few are left interrupted due to another COVID-19 pause. Like a few series are three-game sweeps, but then other series that are tied at two games apiece have to pause and then remain unfinished. Oh, God. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, looking forward to your next mock draft. Brother, can you spare some Anton Lundell? <laughs> Stay fresh, cheese bags. Uh, the adjustable rear wing podcast is good day. Dud duds. I hope you you've recovered from glorious number one independence day yesterday and honored your country by setting off illegal fireworks because freedom and liberty for all, please note freedom and liberty, not actually available for all. Since you've likely discussed return to play in the CBA, it's time to become an F1 podcast. Each of you pick your team for this season and some predictions for race two and how you think uh, racing at the same track two weeks in a row affects the strategy for teams. Pay attention, golf guy, and give us some input. And you, cop guy, none of this. I don't watch F1 nonsense. We pay our Patreon bucks. Answer the questions. All right, guys. Today was the first F1 race of the season, and it was maybe one of the craziest races of the past five years. Yes, I really liked how that guy... Um ran a good race and eventually won okay i'm gonna start listing teams and you guys pick you get first dibs as i list them and only one person per team okay mercedes damn Damn it (laughs) okay mercedes goes to evan brad i'll i'll even let you pick before me mercedes mclaren renault ferrari um williams racing point uh i uh (laughs) Alpha Tori, Alpha Romeo. Okay, those all sound terrible. I'm going with Ferrari. Ooh, mistake. They have a bad car this year. Although they do have Charles Leclerc, who's an amazing driver. Um, and with that, I'll take Red Bull, who I conveniently didn't list. Lewis Hamilton drives for Mercedes, right? He does. Oh, I'm good then. And he got bumped down to fourth today, so he is going to be pissed and come out and win the next race by 25 seconds, provided that they can fix their gearbox because this track's curbs are so high vibration that it's throwing off the sensors in the car none of that sounded interesting to me no it it was actually i i wish you guys would have watched it uh jersey time to celebrate us and a day what are the three best mother russia jerseys of all time og red army ccc p1s have to be in there right yeah the red army era have to be in there just by virtue of like the history behind for, them. I don't think modern Russian hockey jerseys have been nice. For the last 20 years, I feel like the Russians have just kept modifying the same jersey over and over again. And I actually could not tell you the difference in any of them. Uh, I didn't like their 90s iterations of it either. So really, the the old uh, uh, the old Soviet era were probably the only good Russia jerseys, truth be told. Yeah. There was one with like the bottom bar that had like the diamonds and CCCP. Oh the yeah, tracks. those ones are sweet. Yeah, that was um, there have been. I'm pretty sure there have been ones with the hammer and sickle on, and that's just hysterical. <laughs> uh, there definitely have been. There are. I know there have been international ones. I think there were Nike ones where like the bottom half was white, and then they used negative space on the upper half, which was red for like a crest thingy, and it had like wings. Those ones are cool. Um, I really should look up the history of them. And then he wrote, stay fresh in cheese bags in Russian underneath. Uh, birthday boy Trev says, I'm sure this is too late, but can y'all explain escrow and how it works? This has always confused me. Long story short, uh, the NHL and the NHLPA are two different parties who have agreed to split NHL revenue in a, with a certain percentage. And basically what escrow is is it holds a certain percentage of the players salaries in case uh league revenues or team revenues are lower for one reason or another for example a pandemic hits or you know really small market teams made the playoffs so playoff revenues weren't as high so teams didn't get as much as predicted so in case and, and the amount of output to players is consistent you can predict that at the beginning of the year by just counting up how much all the salaries are for that year. So they withhold a certain amount and then they feed it back to the owner's side until the balance reaches 50, 50 or 51, 49 or whatever the agreement is in that CBA. The players then get back what wasn't used, uh, to make the owners whole sometimes as late as years later. And it's always like <laughs> a p- percentage of what they had originally given up. So players hate it because it's their money that they are losing preemptively and they don't always get it all back. And if they do get it all back, that's a lot of opportunity costs lost to them because you don't mess around with millions of dollars um, and just let it sit there. They want to invest it or spend it on drugs. 
<laughs> nose beers. Yeah. Um, and so you can see why players hate it. All right. Time for some Reddit questions before we wrap this one up. Um, uh, ba ba Rusi eighteen. Oh, talks about what he would want to or what they would want to see Eisman do with the cap space. Cross crease passes. I think there's a group of ten players that the Wings could pick from, depending on who LA and Ottawa take. Byfield, Stutzla, Perfetti, Raymond, Rossi, Holtz, Drysdale, Sanderson, Lundell, and Askarov. Do you have a dark horse outside of that group? I hope not. Yeah, me neither. Jack Quinn, maybe. Yeah, you you might be looking at someone like a Jack Quinn, but I really I can't I couldn't pick one. Not without it being arbitrary. Um Wade Baca says, would you rather drop from one to nine in one draft or nine spots overall in four drafts, drafting always in the top ten but never first? Oh, nine to or one to nine one time. Yeah, a hundred percent. Give me nine better drafts to sacrifice one draft. Um, all right. Evan, pick a number from one to four. Four. All right. Darren Fox says, I come with another Kozlov question. What is the most memorable Kozlov moment for you? Um, example, the goal that sent them to the finals, smashing foot's face into the glass, etc. Uh, my, the immediate one that came to mind to me was uh, game five against Chicago in 95. When he, the stop and cut five hole on Belfour. Oh, I was... I've only ever watched that on replay. I obviously was too young to watch it at the time, but I do know the one that you're talking uh, about. There was also the triple OT goal against Anaheim, which I was in bed for, so I missed that live as well. The triple OT goal is mine. Uh, we'll never forget that one. I just love some of my favorite memories of the Red Wings of old are just like the double and triple ridiculous overtime games that they won. Now we don't get double and triple overtime because we don't make the playoffs. <laughs> even, even and with that, we're the last few years we made the playoffs. What, can you remember one? Like every overtime game that I can remember, I was pretty sure ended in the first from like t- 2013, 2014, 2015. There were no good overtime yeah. games in those in that window. With that, we're going to wrap up this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. We'd like to thank all of our listeners, our name level Patreon sponsors, um, the septic tank of that bitch, Carol Baskins, Greech. Jeremiah Dobo, Jake Kiefer, Drunky the Dwarf, Brad Smith, Andrew Bohan, Scott Martin, Jacob Turner, Matt McKay, Brandon M., Matthew M. Rice, Luke Johnson, Clayton Van Dyken, Kalen Wood, Hassam al Qasem, Arjun Shanker, Charlie Elkins, Hana Lee, uh, Birthday Boy Trev, Chris Ripley, Alex Ott, Ashley Van Conant, Chris Frank, Connor Leighton, Danny Jr., Matthew Keeler, Simon Anderson, Antonio Gracias, John Evans, K. Waz, and Stan Olson. Thank you all. We will be back with you midweek. Take care. Stay safe. Evan, give him something to close on. We love you. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.